Hello everyone, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Meg. And today's video is gonna be about how you can become a little mad scientist in your garden, how you can have fun by creating your own hybrid plants. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear the word hybrid is Vampire Diaries, where Klaus is running around trying to create his vampire werewolf hybrids. And this is kind of like that, but with plants. I recently made a really cool hybrid in my garden. So this is also going to kind of be like a show and tell because I'm actually really excited about it. This might just look like a regular squash to you, but to me, it's very special because my garden made this squash. This is a hybrid between honey nut squash and trombetta squash. I've been calling it honey betta just because I think that's a really cute name for a cute little squash. And this squash has been the top performer in my garden this year. It's been extremely resistant to squash vine borer. It's been resistant to bean beetles. It's been resistant to powdery mildew. It's been resistant to everything and it's just been growing like crazy. And that's honestly kind of one of the main pros of hybrid plants. When I very first started gardening and I wanted to get into seed starting, I was really reluctant to buy hybrid seeds because heirloom seeds were all the rage. All of the gardening content creators were like, you have to buy heirloom seeds. It's, it's better for this and it's better for that. And while heirloom seeds are really cool because they're heirloom seeds, they have not been hybridized. They haven't been touched for centuries. So they have like this really cool, rich history behind them. So I'm not knocking heirloom seeds at all. I really love heirloom seeds, but when you live in a place that's a little bit more challenging to grow things like the Southeast or even further South, like Texas and Florida, shout out to Texans and Floridians because I don't know how y'all do it. I don't know how y'all garden, but in these more challenging environments, sometimes heirloom seeds don't really hold up. And this is where hybrid seeds come in because gardeners, seed companies, they will create hybridized seeds that will breed for resistance to certain pests or diseases or whatever. It's just creating stronger genetics in these varieties to make them last in these challenging growing conditions. I remember one year I was seed shopping and I saw all of these hybrids and I was like, you know what, it's saying in the description that this is more resistant to powdery mildew. It's saying in the description this is more resistant to squash vine borer. It's saying that it's more resistant to all of these problems that I was having in my garden. So I did it, I bought the hybrid seeds and I have never looked back. If it's a plant that I don't have trouble growing, I will grow an heirloom variety. If it's a plant I have trouble growing, I will try a hybrid variety because most likely I can find a hybrid that has been bred to be resistant to the problem that I'm facing. And more recently, I have been experimenting with trying to create my own hybrids because if you're creating seeds in your own environment, they're already tailored to your environment. It's also just really fun to create your own things, create your own varieties of plants. Honestly, if you're a backyard gardener and you save your own seeds, you are probably hybridizing things maybe without even realizing it. I think a lot of beginner gardeners, when they save seeds from a tomato, but then they were growing like 10 other varieties of tomatoes like right next to each other, they think that those seeds are going to be the same exact tomato the next year, and they might but also there are flying insects that pollinate our plants for us. And those insects, they're spreading pollen everywhere. Different varieties are crossing with each other. So most likely if you save seeds from something that year and you had other varieties growing really closely together, odds are it's gonna be a hybridized seed. So you can experiment with hybridization in your garden on purpose or on accident. And honestly, I kind of do a mix of both. Here's how you hybridize in the open pollinated lazy type of way. And that's kind of how I ended up with this hybrid. So like I was saying, if you're a backyard gardener, most likely you're not growing the same variety of everything. Us backyard gardeners, we love trying new varieties and we love growing many different varieties of each different type of crop. So when you are leaving your garden open pollinated by bees and other insects, cross pollination is happening. Pollination really depends on the plant. So like I was talking about tomatoes earlier, but tomatoes, they are less likely to cross pollinate than other species of crops because tomatoes, their flower has both of 
their fertile parts right there on the same flower so they're considered self-fertile and the parts are just so close together that it's harder for things to cross-pollinate but it's not impossible and it does happen. Then we've got our cucurbits, like our cucumbers and our squash, and those are a lot easier to cross-pollinate because they have these separate male and female flowers. So there's like a little bit more control if you wanna do more controlled pollination, but we're just talking about lazy pollination here, open pollination. So to hybridize the lazy way, you just have to do nothing. Let nature make its crosses for you. You can either just let things rot on the ground and see what pops up as volunteers the next year, which is what I did with this one, or you can save seeds. Um, if you live in like a colder climate and volunteers don't happen quite as often, you might wanna save those seeds and then just plant them the next year. So what happened with this one is last year I had a honey nut squash and a trombetta squash growing side by side. They're both cucurbita machadas, so they're the exact same species of squash, just different varieties. Squash and cucumbers, things like that, if it's the same species, so there's different species of squash, there's machada, pepo, maxima, there's a bunch of others. If it's the same species, it's way more likely to create a cross for you. So the honey nut and trombetta were planted side by side. There was a honey nut that had been eaten by some pests. It just didn't look good. So I just left it there. I just let it fall to the ground. I let it rot there. And then the next year, which was this year back in May, I saw something sprouting and I knew that it was that honey nut because that was the only squash that I had left to rot that year. So I was like, hmm, this is gonna be really interesting. I wonder what it's gonna be because the only cucurbita machadas that I had planted were the honey nut, the trombetta, and I also had seminal pumpkin planted nearby as well. So I was like, I wonder if it's gonna come out honey nut, if it's gonna be a cross between one or the other, like I don't know what's gonna happen. So this thing started growing and growing and basically the conclusion that I came to is that it is way too large to be a honey nut. Usually honey nuts are maybe here, even maybe even smaller honey nuts are like the miniature version of butternuts and honey nuts I'm pretty sure are like a hybrid themselves. And then it kind of looks like a trombetta, especially with this elongated neck here, but it's too small to be a trombetta because trombettas are very, very tall like this. So I was like, it looks like the perfect baby of a honey nut and a trombetta. I'm going to save seeds from this. I'm gonna replant it next year and then see what else pops up. Maybe it crossed with something else. I planted a ton of cucurbita machadas this year, so it could have crossed with something else. And honestly, I'm just gonna keep planting generations of seeds and see like what kind of crazy squash I end up with like five years from now that started from this one, I don't know. If I were trying to have fun cross-pollinating things in my garden and I wanted a little bit more control, say I wanted to cross this plant with this plant and I wanted to know that that's what I was crossing, then what you would have to do is just do like a, a closed pollination type of thing and use something like this. This is an organza bag. So you would just want to keep the flower that you are wanting to pollinate and you are wanting to eventually collect seeds from, you would want to keep this bag over it and that would just prevent insects from getting in there and pollinating for you. For instance, with squash, if you're wanting to cross one squash with another squash, you would want to put one of these bags over a female flower and the female flower is the one that has the fruit coming out of the bottom of it. A male flower does not. Put this bag over the female flower and then you would have to cross pollinate yourself using like a paintbrush or something. You would just take a paintbrush and you would collect pollen from any male flower that you wanted of the one species and then put the pollen on the female flower of the other species that you are wanting to cross pollinate and then just keep this bag on the fruit until that flower has closed up and there's no risk of cross pollination by an insect. Eventually that squash will grow and then you'll save seeds from that squash and you'll replant the next year. So hybridization can take a long time because you can't kind of like immediately do it. It's usually year by year, but again, it's just something really fun. It makes you feel like a little mad scientist, little botanist up in your garden. 
But not only is hybridization fun in the garden, it's really practical, it's really useful. You can create some really strong, resilient plants with hybridization or just saving seeds from your own garden in general usually gets you much stronger plants because they are already adapted to the little microclimate of your garden and that is where you're gonna get the best plants. Also, flowers are really fun to hybridize and that's something that I'm kind of getting into. I'm, I haven't really, like I've dabbled in it, but I haven't really gotten into it and I can see myself getting very scientific with it and like I want to cross this with this and come up with this color and there are so many seed companies out there that do that so well like Florette Flower I love her seeds I love her business the way that they come up with these amazing colors is so inspiring they're so beautiful and it just inspires me to want to do that in my own garden. The only flowers I've really hybridized so far are snapdragons just because they're really easy and snapdragons are known to just kind of switch up their colors anyways. But I really want to get into trying to hybridize some zinnias or some dahlias or something. Okay, we've talked about the pros of hybridization, how it's fun, how it's great, how it's an experiment and everyone should try it but there are some cons to it. One of the main cons of hybridization is you just don't know what you're gonna get. You could get a not so desirable crop the next year. And it can sometimes produce crops that don't taste good, don't grow well, just are unstable. They might have you know, mutations and they just don't grow at all. Like you just don't know what you're gonna get. So it's like flipping a coin. You might get something amazing, you might get something not so amazing. An example of this is in my first year of gardening, I saved seeds from a mortgage lifter tomato plant. This was the first time I'd ever saved seeds. And I was like, wow, I'm really doing it out here. I'm saving my own seeds. Well, the next year comes around and I go to plant those seeds. And what pops up is definitely something that looked like exactly like the mortgage lifter tomato that I had grown the year before, but it did not taste like it. It was a disgusting tomato. It was tasteless. It tasted like water. I tried everything. I messed with my watering schedule. I thought maybe I was over or under watering the whole plant, but the entire season, those tomatoes tasted the exact same. And I am pretty sure that it had hybridized with something else and it just produced a not so desirable tomato. Even though you're hybridizing with the hopes that you're gonna get something bigger and better and tastier, it just might not always happen. And then another con to hybridization is that it can potentially be dangerous, like lethal. But only when we're talking about squash. There's this thing called toxic squash syndrome. And I had never heard of it until a follower had commented something. I think it was a few years ago because I was also, I had a hybrid squash in my garden and they were like, are you not worried about toxic squash syndrome? And I was like, what is that? But it's a real thing. And I might've been a little over dramatic by saying it's lethal. I don't think that there, I don't think that actually, I don't know if there's any been any reported deaths. Hold on. I need to fact check this. Okay, I was being a little bit dramatic there. There haven't been any reported deaths from toxic squash syndrome, but the symptoms definitely look like something I do not want to go through ever. So toxic squash syndrome can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hair loss, and it can potentially cause death, even though it hasn't, but it has the potential to if someone eats a lot of a squash that is toxic like this. It says that there have been a few reported cases of more severe reactions like hospitalization, but no deaths. So what causes toxic squash syndrome? And this can be in any kind of squash. So anything in the cucurbitaceae family, so your pumpkins, gourds, squash, there are compounds in squash called cucurbitacins. These occur naturally and they're in every squash, but in really high, high levels, that's when they can cause the toxic squash syndrome. They are toxic to us in high levels. And what can cause these random, really high levels of cucurbitacins in squash is hybridization. Like I said, during hybridization, you never know what you're gonna get, you never know what is happening in that plant like DNA wise. And some hybridized squash can just create these crazy high levels of cucurbitacins making it toxic. So be aware of that when you are hybridizing squash. Luckily, there's a really easy way to tell if your 
squash is toxic or not. The curbitacins are extremely bitter. So always, always taste your squash raw. If it tastes bitter, spit it out, it's toxic. Raw squash is not supposed to taste bitter. So this can even happen from grocery store squash if you think about it, because you never know where that squash is coming from. You never know if it's been crossed with something. Um, squash at a farmer's market. So it's kind of just a, a rule of thumb. I feel like everyone should know. They should just kind of tell everyone this. It should be on billboards everywhere. Is your squash toxic? Make sure it's not bitter. <laughs> I feel like it's like a common knowledge thing that should be known, but it's not. I didn't know about it until like two years ago. I don't know why you would eat anything that's bitter anyways. These people that have been hospitalized and stuff like I'm just thinking, if it was that bitter, why were you eating it? Maybe a loved one made it and they taste it and they're like, oh my God, this is awful. And they just didn't wanna say anything to be nice. That's like the only thing I can think of. But I really wanna know, like I actually wanna find these people that have had it and I wanna ask them, was it not bitter? How did this happen to you? Don't worry, this is not toxic. I have tried it. Actually, me and my neighbor Menchi in my last video, we made a Filipino dish called pinak bet with one of these and I made sure to try it first before we used it. And it tastes just like a regular butternut, honestly. It, it's, it's giving butternut. It's really sweet. It held up well in the pinak bet, which is like a, a stew. So I think it would make a really good just like butternut soup. Actually having thyroid surgery in a few weeks, so I'm thinking this is probably gonna become some soup because I can only eat soup for like the first few days after that surgery. If you're a little mad scientist in your garden and you're like a pro at hybridization, drop down in the comments, let us know any tips that you have for us that we can all learn from. Or even if you've like come up with something really cool on accident, let us know what you came up with. I hope this video inspired you to get out in your garden, experiment with things, have fun, save your own seeds, or do what I do and just let things rot on the ground on purpose to see what comes up the next year. That's what gardening is supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be experimental. It's so fun to see how nature just works. And it is now starting to rain on me. So I hope you learned something from this video. If you did, be sure to like it, be sure to subscribe, be sure to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Substack, and check out the Garden Girls podcast. We actually just released an episode today about seed saving in our garden, so go and check that out. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!